اوكي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيك ما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد so الحمد لله we continue with uh, our Wednesday sisters class as we explore Kitab al-Nikah from Sahih al-Bukhari. Alhamdulillah, we've arrived at class number 23. That means that we've had 23 classes. Uh, each class is roughly about an hour and a half. So you can kind of do the math of how many hours you've been you've been attending class. So that's that's roughly around 30 hours almost about 30 hours of class that you guys have taken. That's equivalent to probably a college course that you've taken already. SubhanAllah. Uh, but alhamdulillah, we're going to keep going. So we arrive at um, chapter number 18. This will be an interesting chapter. Uh, and this is the chapter Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, bawwaba al-Bukhari, um, bab ma yu'taqa min shu'm al-mar'a. وقوله تعالى وإن من أزواجكم وأولادكم عدو لكم. The chapter or the 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 chapter of evil or bad omen of a woman and what should be feared of the evil omen of a woman or the bad omen of a woman and uh, evil omen or what we would translate today as bad luck. What should be feared or avoided from the bad luck of a woman? All right, and we'll 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 dive into that. And then he mentions the ayah from the Quran. If someone could find the ayah, in the min azwaji kum wa auladu kum adu walakum fahdaruhum, and indeed from amongst your wives and your children are enemies to you. So be aware of them. Indeed, from amongst your wives and your children are enemies to you. Be aware of them. All right. So, Surah sixty four. Uh, I believe that is Surah al uh, Surah 64, Ayat 14. Surah 64, Ayat 14. Let me write that down. 64, 14. Okay, so as I said to you guys before, um, if you want to know um, the context of an ayat, what should you do first? What's the first place that you should go if you read this ayah and you want to know what this ayah means, what is the backstory behind this ayah? What's the first place that you should go? Tafsir, right. And even before the tafsir, if you, you have the book, you have access to the book, and that is the reasons why certain ayats and hadith were revealed. Asbab, sabab, and nuzul. Very good, Jade. Sabab, and nuzul. So you want to look at the context. What is the backstory behind the revelation of this ayah? And I'll get into that, inshallah ta'ala, so that you have some context. All right. So Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, is using this ayah. So he begins the chapter title with an ayat. And then underneath that chapter title, he brings four hadith that we're going to cover, inshallah ta'ala. All right. So he sometimes will just mention the chapter title. And sometimes he'll mention a chapter title and he'll mention an ayat to justify it, or he'll mention a statement from one of the Sahaba to justify it, or he'll mention a portion of a hadith or a portion of an incident to justify it. And it just shows you the knowledge of Imam al-Bukhari, the vast knowledge of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. So let's get into, uh, before we get into the hadith, um, before we uh, get into the hadith that are underneath this chapter title, let's talk about why he mentioned this chapter title. Ma yutaqa min shu'm al mar'a. Shu'm, um, which is bad luck, if we would translate it like that, bad luck. And before we get into the chapter title, the first thing that we need to understand is that we view everything as it relates to ideology or belief through, our, through the lens of our Islamic theology or aqidah. 
Anytime you hear something related to beliefs because a bad omen or evil omen or bad luck is it kind of teeters on belief. It is it is a belief. It is a belief about something. All right. If you believe that something is bad luck or you believe that something, you know, has an evil omen or bad omen attached to it, that now is 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 inclining towards or leaning towards a belief. And so anytime we are confronted with a belief or ideology, the first thing we do is look at it through our Islamic aqidah. What does Islam say about bad luck? What does Islam say about evil omens or bad omens? Does Islam say anything about it? Uh, that's a question for you guys. What does Islam say about bad luck or bad omen or evil omen? Does anybody know anything from the Quran or the Sunnah or from what you've read or from what you've studied as it relates to Aqidah? What, what are we, how do we approach that? There's a group full of Muslims here. A group full of Muslims listening. The, the, the comments should be pouring in because we're talking about something that is very important to us. Um, so someone says Muslim does not believe in superstitions. Okay. But you still didn't give me any textual evidence for that general, not to believe in jinx. Uh, you guys are not convincing me if a non-Muslim came to you or a new Muslim came to you and said, that's bad luck. And you were correcting them about their belief in bad luck. How do you correct them? This, this should be a no-brainer. An omen is not superstition. No, it is. It is to some degree. An omen is, it's a belief about that if you do this, then this is going to happen. Or if that happens, then that is a bad sign that this is going to happen. So it is a super, it is a form of superstition. And in Arabic is called tatayya. Yes, it is a superstition. Okay, very good, Dominga. Very good, Jade. Now you guys are you. Now you're in the area. <laughs> no, it's not black magic. It's not black magic, and black magic is real. <laughs> black magic is shirk. Black magic is kufr. Um, but a uh, tatayor is not bad luck or superstition is not black magic. Complete two totally different things. So. As Dominga mentioned, there is whatever good or bad happens, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that nothing can determine good or bad except by the power and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first thing. When you hear bad luck or something happens that is a sign of bad luck or this is a sign of bad luck, we repel that or we refute that. Number one, by our Islamic belief that there is no good or bad except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed everything that is to take place. What was the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created? The pen, right? The Prophet sallallahu said, Oh, wa ma khalaq Allah al qalam. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was the pen. And he told the pen, Uktu, write. And the pen said, well, what shall I write? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Uktu kulla ma huwa ka'an ila qiyam as -sa Write everything that is going to take place until the day of judgment. Everything that is going to take place. That means down to every single raindrop, how many drops of rain, where the drop of rain is going to go, who it's going to hit, who it's going to miss, every leaf that falls off of a tree, Every single thing, every time you're going to blink, how many times you're going to blink in your life, how many times your heart is going to beat in your life, how many times you're going to swallow from the time you're born to the time you die, everything is written. Allah says all of it is written in a book and, all, and this is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything that was to take place was in this in this life and in the hereafter was all recorded in a book called Alohim Mahfuz, the sacred tablet. 
right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created the pen and told the pen to write, this all happened 50,000 years before anything was created. This was before there were any creation, anything. And the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was over water. وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَى مَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this 50,000 years before anything in creation. So nothing takes place in this world, in this life, except with the permission and knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't believe in bad luck. Evil omen or bad omen or bad luck or good luck, because we do believe in good luck, and I'll come back to that. All right. We do believe in good luck, and I'll come back to that. But evil omen or bad luck and good luck, they don't change anything. Your belief that this happened, so this is going to happen, or because you saw this, this is going to happen, right? This evil omen or bad luck doesn't change anything. And what makes it haram, what makes it shirk, it's a form of shirk, is that people believe that when they see this, for example, if a black, black cat walks in front of you, that's a sign of bad luck, right? Or if you're sweeping the broom and the broom accidentally touches your foot, you got to spit on the broom because then that'll give you bad luck. These are all superstitions. These are all, they believe that because this happened, if you break a mirror, then you'll have bad luck for seven years. All of these are superstitions. And people believe that because this happened, this is going to happen to you. Then it excludes God from the equation. It excludes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the equation, almost as if you know for surety that this is going to happen to you because that happened. And so it is an erasure. It is a dismiss it is dismissive of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah decreed. You guys follow me? Am I making sense? So we don't believe in bad luck because it removes the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the equation. Nothing. We say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no power, no might, no strength. No one has the power to do anything. No bad, no black cat, no broken mirror. Nothing has the power to inflict some harm on you except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So evil omen is, or good omen, they don't change anything. These are beliefs. These are beliefs about things because of something happening, then it, it affects a belief within us. But that belief does not make this happen or that happen, right? Because those things only happen by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. Number two, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees is good. So we don't, this is a second reason why we don't believe in bad luck, because everything that happens to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for us is good, even if we can't see the good in it. It's good. The Prophet used to say in dua, and all good is in your hands, and there is no evil attributed to you. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for us to happen to us as the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is either the decree within us, the decree upon us, or the decree from us. Meaning, the qadr is three levels. There is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed in us. Meaning, things that go on inside of us that we have no control over. Things that go on inside of us in our lives that we have no control over. That is the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in us. Then there is the decree upon us. Then there are the things that Allah decreed to happen to us in our lives that we still don't have any control over. So there's the decree in us. There's the decree upon us. What Allah decreed to happen to us or, dis, or, or you know, predetermined to happen to us that we have no control over. Who our parents are, where we're going to be born, what the weather is, the skin, our skin complexion. These are things that are decreed upon us that we have no control over. And then there are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that we are going to do that, 
we have some control over and we will be responsible for, and that's our actions. But even those, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already, he already has knowledge of what we're going to do even before we do it. But we have control over our actions and we will be responsible for our actions. So the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed to happen to us, they are all good, even if we can't see the good in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hikmah, has wisdom, and sometimes his wisdom is just too far for our mind. Like, you do know that out of 100% of our brain, we only access about 8% of our brain. The most intelligent from amongst us only accesses between 8 to 10% of their brain. And so a creature that can only access this small percentage, one-tenth of his brain capacity, her brain capacity, the most intelligent from amongst us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lahu hikmatu badiqa, to him belongs infinite wisdom. There is for sure, can someone um, unplug that? I don't want to talk over the Quran. Then for sure, there's going to be things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decree upon us that we can't wrap our heads around. We can't fathom. We can't understand. We can't understand. And so we don't believe in bad luck because even what you believe is bad luck or evil omen is actually something that is good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Asa an takrahu shay'an wa yaja'alullahu fihi khayran kathira. Perhaps you may hate a thing and Allah has placed an abundance of good in it. You hate something, but there is an abundance of good in it. So that's another reason why we don't believe in bad luck. However, let's go back to good luck. Good luck, where we see something and we interpret it as a good sign. It's a good sign. Not necessarily good luck, but we believe that there are signs that point to something that may possibly work in our favor. All right. So I don't want to I don't want to go crazy with the term good luck. But if a person uses the phrase good luck, right, you get Muslims that get very extreme and they'll say, we don't believe in luck. Someone says to you, good luck with that. You say, oh, no, uh, I, we don't believe in good luck or good fortune. You know, I mean, we're not going to play semantics. Good luck, good fortune. It all means the same thing. It all means the same thing. It's all pointing to the same thing. And that is that something may happen and we interpret it as a good sign. As a good sign. And that is part of our deen. We should be, op that's what's called optimism. We should be optimistic. We should see something happen and then interpret it as a good sign that something is, you know, going to happen that is good. Like saying Bismillah or inshallah. No, no, no. When you say Bismillah over something, is you're asking Allah to put his barakah in it. That's Bismillah. We say Bismillah before we eat. We say Bismillah before we begin driving. We say Bismillah before we go into our home. We say, Bis no, that's that's not a belief that we hope something. No, that's when you mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over something, he's going to put barakah in it. So not like Bismillah, not like inshallah. Well, no, inshallah is different. Is Inshallah is referring the action back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not taking responsibility or taking control over your actions, saying, I'm going to do this tomorrow, inshallah. Meaning, if Allah allows me, that's, that's not optimism. That's not optimism. That's you putting the power in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not saying, I'm going to do this tomorrow. That's you taking full responsibility that this is going to happen tomorrow without including Allah in the equation. And then this is what strips you of your barakah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show you that you are not the power he is. But you might see something, right? Let's say, for example, husband and wife is having an argument and uh, they go and they sit with an imam and the imam, you know, kind of brings some perspective to this, you know, contention that they're having. And they go about their business afterwards and the imam says, 
it looks that's a good sign that you guys are, you know, going to work because we had a great discussion and you walked out of the discussion and it seems like you guys were, you know, and so I'm optimistic. This is a good sign that inshallah, you guys are going to make it in your marriage. So he interprets the fact that the conversation ended on a good note. He interprets that as a good sign that your marriage is going to work. That's part of our deen. You should be optimistic. You should be optimistic. The Prophet ﷺ was optimistic. I'll give you an example. When the Prophet ﷺ and the believers went from uh, Mecca to uh, from Medina to Mecca to perform Umrah, right during what is called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, happened in the sixth year after Hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ took fourteen hundred of the believers to go from Medina to Mecca to perform Umrah. And of course, you guys are familiar with the story. When they got to, uh, right before they entered into Mecca, they stopped at a place called Al Hudaybiyah. And the Kuffar of Quraysh would not allow them to enter into Mecca. And it was there they signed a peace treaty. However, before they signed the peace treaty, uh, many of the believers, although in their garb, their pilgrim garb, they had on the Izar and the Rida, they didn't, you know, didn't come to fight. But some of them had knives, you know, for. You know, like if they wanted to kill an animal, slaughter an animal and, and eat the animal, you know, on the way, they bought little pocket knives with them, or whatever, but they didn't bring weapons. However, when they were stopped by Quraysh, many of the Muslims was like, no, we want to fight. We're going to fight with whatever we have, but they're not going to stop us from performing Umrah. And the Prophet ﷺ asked the, uh, asked the disbelievers to come to terms. Let's see if we can negotiate. And the Kuffar of Quraysh, they sent a man by the name of Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr sent him to go negotiate with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the believers. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Suhail coming towards him, he turned to the Muslims and he said, Qad sahulallahu alaykum amrakum. Allah has made your affairs easy. He was optimistic because the man's name was Suhail. Suhail comes from the word Sahel. Sahel means easy. Suhail means someone who is easygoing. It's the opposite of Shadid. I named uh, one of my sons Suhail, you know, so he would be the opposite of me. Suhail means easygoing, gentle. And so when the Prophet ﷺ saw Suhail coming, he interpreted that as a good sign that we're going to be able to come to terms and go back home safe. He said, Allah has made your affair easy. He had optimism. He interpreted that as a good sign, good luck or good fortune. All right. And there are so many other examples, but we should have optimism. And if a person decides to interpret that as good luck, we shouldn't play semantics. We know exactly what the person means, that this is a sign that something good is coming or on the way or, you know, in the works. But when people say, oh, good luck. Oh, no, we don't believe in luck. It's just like, man, subhanAllah, learn your deen. Learn your religion, man. SubhanAllah, sometimes we are, un and I mean, this harshness comes from ignorance. Knowledge brings mercy and compassion and understanding. Harshness is a result of ignorance, not a result of knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man That gentleness is not put into anything except that it makes it beautiful. So I'll say, I'll say that again. Ignorance brings about harshness and knowledge brings about gentleness. When you see a person that is, you know, unnecessarily harsh and rigid, that is a sign of their ignorance, not a sign of their knowledge. In the religious community, we interpret that as the person being, you know, extremely religious and, you know, overzealous when it comes to their spirituality. But in fact, it is a sign of their ignorance. A person that doesn't have knowledge has to overcompensate with harshness. A person that has knowledge of the dean, they don't have to overcompensate. So you'll find them to be very gentle. You'll find them to be very compassionate. You'll find them to be very understanding. You'll find them to have a very negotiable spirit because of knowledge. They don't have to overcompensate. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, مَكَانَ الرِّفْكُ فِي شَيْءٍ 
illazana, that gentleness is not inserted into any scenario except that it will make it beautiful. وَمَا كَانَ الْعُنْفُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَ And that harshness is not put or inserted into any scenario except that it's going to make it ugly. And Ibn Qayyim, he said, أَهْلُ السُنَّةِ أَعْلَمَ النَّاسِ بِالْخَالِكِ وَأَرْحَمَهُمْ بِالْخَلْقِ Ibn Qayyim, or was it uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, رحمه الله تعالى, he said that the people of the Sunnah are the most knowledgeable people as it relates to Allah. They're the most knowledgeable people of Allah. Ahlu Sunnah. The people of the Sunnah. They are the most knowledgeable people as it relates to the Creator. And they are the most merciful of people to the creation. So when you see people who claim to be on the Sunnah, Salafi, and they're very rigid, very harsh, that is an overcompensation for their ignorance. That is an overcompensation for their ignorance. Because a person who has knowledge is very secure in their practice of the religion, and they don't feel the need to overcompensate with harshness. Rather, they, they are secure enough to approach situations with gentleness, with compassion, with mercy, as the Prophet ﷺ did on many occasions, more than we could actually mention. All right? So going back to everybody clear about good omen, good omen, good luck, good fortune, that is premised on or based upon being optimistic. And we should be optimistic. When we see something, we should interpret it as a good sign, right? It's like a one who has good thoughts about a law, thus expects their affairs to be good. Yes, great connection. Great connection. Great connection. So evil omen or bad omen, is a fear of something evil happening because of something else. So when one believes that because something is happening or that is happening, that something bad is going to happen, then they have fallen into a, a tatayyur or a shu'ma, and that is bad omen or evil omen. And so the, the chapter title alludes to the belief that many held before Islam and that evil omen uh, or bad luck uh, is in a woman. Bad bad luck could be found in a woman. And so Imam al-Bukhari mentions the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 64, ayah 14, in the min as wajikum. And this is why understanding the Arabic language is important. Because the min here, for those of you who can read Arabic, if you go back to the Arabic, Allah says, in the min as wajikum. From amongst your wives, meaning some of your wives, meaning not all. So Imam Bukhari is using the ayah to say what? Bad luck or evil omen is not in all women. Not in all women. That's why he's mentioning the ayat. Men means from, but it also means some. Men, and, and the beauty of the Arabic language is that um, the synonyms for one word are sometimes beyond what you can count. There's a whole book that has been written on ma, the mean with the long vowel aleph connected to it. Ma, which could mean water, it could mean what, it could mean <laughs> it could mean so many things. Alladi, it could mean the one which. It has so many different meanings. That's the beauty of the Arabic language. All right. It's the eloquence of the Arabic language. You can use one letter and it has so many different meanings. Just one letter. You'll find that in no other language. One letter has so many different meanings attached to it. But men, yes, it does mean from, uh, but it also means some. Because Allah says, in the men, indeed, some of your wives from meaning from your wives, meaning some of your wives. All right? In the min as wajikum, some of your wives, wa awladikum, and some of your children, aduul lakum, are enemies to you. And so the address here is to the men. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking specifically to the men. All right? So in this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is he saying? 
He's saying, and, and what is, why is Imam al-Bukhari using this ayat here in the chapter title? Because the chapter title is What should be avoided or feared from the bad luck of women? There were some people who held the belief before Islam that, that women are bad luck. Women are bad luck. And so this is what led to men treating women like, you know, material. They, don't, they didn't look at women as human beings. They looked at them as things that they could use. They exploited women for, for their own pleasure, and, and they toss them away when they're done with them, right? They believed that women were evil omens, so they didn't keep women around them. They used them for whatever they used them for, but they didn't get involved in deep relationships with women because they didn't see women to be that valuable. So what Imam Bukhari is saying by using the ayah in the min azwajikum wa awladikum adu wa lakum fahdaruhum that indeed from some of your women and your children are enemies to you. So be aware of them, showing you that not all women are bad luck, but some women may have, you know, may have some bad luck attached to them. And we'll we'll talk about what he means by that. Not bad luck in the sense that. If this woman is a bad woman, then something is going to happen to you. But there is some truth to that. As we're going to see, even the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, he said, if there was a such thing as bad luck, it would be in a bad woman. So the Prophet Sallallahu is not confirming bad luck, but he's saying that if according to your belief, there was a such thing as bad luck, it would be in a bad woman. Because what does a bad woman do for a man? A woman who has bad character, a woman who doesn't follow his instructions, is not obedient or willfully compliant. What does that do to a man who has his head screwed on straight, who is destined for, you know, some greatness in life? And he has a woman that is going in the completely opposite direction. She is going to compromise everything for him. And so in that case, if there was bad luck in anything, it would be in a bad woman, meaning a woman with bad character. A woman with bad character, a woman who doesn't listen, a woman who is disobedient, a woman who, you know, once doesn't respect his leadership. She is going to compromise everything that he is going to become, which is why when Prophet Ibrahim salam, went to go visit his son, Ismail, you remember the hadith when he went to go visit Ismail. And uh, this is after Ibrahim becomes an older man and he goes to visit his son, Ismail. And Ismail is not home, but his wife is there. And Ibrahim asked the woman, he says, you know, where's your husband? She says, you know, he's out somewhere, just completely dismissive. He's out somewhere doing whatever, earning a living or whatever he's doing. And Ibrahim asks, well, how is your living conditions? You know, how are you guys living? And she begins to complain. We don't have this. We don't have that. We don't have this. We don't have that. And Ibrahim is listening. He never tells her who he is. He just listens. And then because if you let a person talk, they'll tell you everything you need to know. He, When she finishes, he says, when your husband gets home, convey to him the greeting of salam for me. Tell him I said, salam alaikum. And tell him I said, change his threshold. Meaning, change the carpet in front of his door. She still didn't even know. Oblivion still didn't even know what he meant by that. So when Ismail came home, he noticed since something is off, so he says, did someone come by here today? She said, yeah, some old man came by here, right? Just a complete dismissal. She's not even looking for any wisdom in anything, right? Not even optimistic enough to see that, you know, this was his father or this could have been somebody of importance. You know, for him to say when your husband gets home, convey my greeting of salam to him and tell him to change his threshold, that command should have, Raise your antenna because what man, what stranger, what kind of stranger are you to tell me to tell that to my husband? And it never even dawned on her. Never even dawned on her. So Ismail comes home and he says, did somebody come by here today? Uh, his wife says, yes. As a matter of fact, some old man came by here today. And Ismail said, well, what did he say? She said, he asked about our living condition and then he told me something to tell you that I found a, a bit strange. He told me to tell you 
you know, assalamu alaikum, to convey the greeting of salam to you and to tell you to change your threshold. What does that mean? So Ismail said, well, that was my father, that old man that came by here. That was my father, Prophet Ibrahim, my father, with respect, my father. He said, and change your threshold means to divorce you. You're divorced. Go home to your family. Why did Ibrahim tell his son to divorce this woman after only meeting her for a few moments why did he tell him to divorce his wife? He was ungrateful. Because of because her ingratitude would lead to her compromising his journey towards being a prophet. Because if a woman is ungrateful for a little, she's eventually going to be ungrateful for a lot. You understand? If you can't show gratitude for a little, then by default, you're not going to show gratitude for a lot. Gratitude starts when you have nothing. You understand? Gratitude doesn't start. You say, OK, when I get, you know, this mountain of gold or I get this big house, this mansion, then I'm going to be grateful. So until then, you're going to be ungrateful for the journey. And then when you get to the destination, then you're going to be grateful. That's delusional thinking. Delusional thinking. As they say, a man is tested when he has everything and a woman is tested when the man has nothing. Your test is when the man has nothing. Because if you can endure that time and be grateful for the little that you have, when he eventually arrives at his destination, arrives at greatness in his life, then you will be grateful for the, for the, for the a lot that you have. All right. So what Ibrahim was noticing from these few moments is that this woman is going to compromise your journey to greatness. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means by the ayah. Inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adu lakum fahdaruhum. That indeed some of your wives and some of your children are enemies to you. Not enemies in they're going to fight you, but enemies in their ungrateful nature is going to make you compromise your journey to greatness. They're going to make you compromise. Because if a woman is ungrateful for the little bit that you're providing, then as a man, you are going to be forced to do more because you want her to be grateful. You want to see her happy. She's always displeased with the little bit that you give her. So that puts you on this hamster wheel to spend your entire life trying to get her to a place where she's finally satisfied. And some men only realize at the end of their road that there is, there is no pleasing this woman. And you spent your whole entire life on the hamster wheel. Compromised your entire life. Compromised your entire journey for greatness. You know how many men have never achieved greatness in their life simply because of the woman that they married to? That's a fact. Old hard fact. That's nothing against women, but women, if you are honest with yourselves, you can look at a man and tell he's going nowhere with her. He is going nowhere with her. And this is why it's very important for men to choose from a place of power. Choose from a place of power. Don't choose from a place of weakness. And that goes for women as well. When you choose a spouse, choose from a place of power, not from a place of weakness. What do I mean by that? Choose from a place of power. What does that mean? Don't choose anybody just because they're giving you attention. Don't choose anybody just because they're giving you attention. A little deeper than that. Choose from a place of power. Salam alaikum. Hold on, sisters. Say it on the Muslim. Say it again. She, a woman that stands for something, she has a backbone. Mm -hmm. Not quite. I'll give one, one more shot. Go for it. Choose from a place of power, not from a place of weakness. 
What does that mean? Go ahead. Choosing. Um, make choosing with uh, thinking Islamically and choosing for the dean and not sexual preference. Okay, well, obviously, if you put an Islamic twist on it, it would be choosing for the purpose of dean. Yes, absolutely. But aside from dean, aside from dean, because that's the priority, but that's not the only quality that you... What I mean when I say choose from a place of power is that you're not choosing to be with someone because you are in need of them. You're not choosing to be with someone because there is a hole in your soul and you need to fill that void. And so you just pick and choose anyone just to fill the void. That's choosing from a place of weakness. I'm lonely. I'm tired of being lonely. So I'll just go find someone. I need a. I need to be in a relationship because I don't like being by myself. So you just go choose someone. Or I'm vulnerable right now, so I just go choose someone. Look at every person that has ever chosen someone from a place of weakness. They were eventually exploited, because once a person see that you only chose them because you were at a weak place in your life, they realize that you don't actually value me. You didn't actually choose me because. You recognize the power and the strength that I have. You chose me because you recognize the weakness that you have. And you were just trying to fill a void. So when you satisfy your own void, when you work on yourself and fix yourself and you get to a place, a position of power in your life, then you can make a choice because you're not choosing the person out of need. You're, you're choosing the person because this is the person, or you're not choosing the person out of want, you're choosing the person out of need. I don't want you, I need you. I don't want you because I've wanted so many things in my life and look what that has got me. You know, you're learning how to prioritize your needs over your wants. And that's a place of power. That is a place of power. Okay, so... Imam al-Bukhari mentions the verse here that says that indeed from amongst your wives and your children are enemies to you. And the reason why he did that was to show that not bad luck is not in all women, only a certain type of woman. And then he's going to go into the hadith mentioning the woman that he's referring to. And so let's go back to the reason why this ayat was revealed. The reason why this verse was revealed, this verse was revealed in Medina. All right, it's a Medini verse, verse that was revealed in Medina. And it was revealed about one of the Sahaba by the name of Auf ibn Malik al Ashja'i, who was married with children. And one of the battles came about, and he wanted to go fight in this particular battle. However, his wife and his children came to him crying, crying, making him feel guilty for going out to go fight. And they would say, Ila men tada'na. Who are you going to leave us to if you die in battle? We don't have anybody else. If you go out and fight and die, then who are you going to leave to take care of us? And this would cause him to sit out of many battles. So he sat out of a few battles, missing out on participating in battle with the Prophet Sallallahu and so he went to the Prophet Sallallahu to complain that, you know, I sat out this battle because my wife and my kids came to me crying and they, you know, made me compromise. I wanted to go out and fight with you, but my wife and my children came to me crying, you know, and saying to me, you know, if you die in battle, who's going to take care of us? And so as a result of that, I didn't go participate in the battle. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed this ayah. This ayah came down because of that incident. So the scholars they say al walad yakunu aduwan li abihi wa zawja takunu aduwatun li zawjihi li zawjiha idha tasabba fi sarf al rajul an ta'ati Allah ta'ala that a husband a, a, a child becomes an enemy to their father and a wife becomes an enemy to her husband when they become the reason by which he deviates from obeying, or being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they become the reason for his disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
And the Prophet وسلم, he mentioned in the hadith that أن الأولاد إنهم لمجنبة مجبنة or محزنة that children create in a man cowardice and create in him grief and worry. Children create in a man cowardice. Children make you a coward. And they create in a man grief and anxiety. That's a fact. Most men are very brave and very, you know, their bravado level is on 10 until they have children because now they start to consider. And for some men, they need that. You know, it, it helps. The, the most important thing that men can do is create a balance. So we, we are here before children in that we putting our lives on the line and risking our lives and risking putting ourselves in risky situations because the only person we have to worry about is ourselves. So we're here on the risk factor. Then children come in and we go here to being cowards, not taking any risk at all. But the most important thing is to find balance here in the middle. All right. Not cowards in that we don't take risks at all anymore and not risky to the point where we're ready to put it all on the line for, you know, for, for reasons that are not necessary, but to find a balance in that. There are some situations that I believe as a man that it is worth you risking yourself for. And there's some situations that's just not worth it. There's some situations that are not worth it. But if if you as a man, you're having children and you're always worried about going to jail or being taken away from your kids or something happening, and you're not being able to be there for your kids. If that's always your worry, then in fact, you are teetering on becoming a coward. Because just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of you and your children, Allah will continue to take care of you and your children. When you say, who are you going to leave us with? What's going to happen to us in the event that something happened to you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is going to take care of you. This is what men say when they go to jail. You know, well, I was trying to feed my family. I'm trying to take care of my family. So now look at you. You in jail now. You ain't taking care of nobody. And the same one that is taking care of your kids while you in jail is the same one that was taking care of your kids when you wasn't in jail. So that's a farce. That's a lie that we tell ourselves to give us uh, ourselves this false sense of pride and this false sense of control over our lives. When in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't kill your children out of poverty for Allah provides for them and for you. Don't kill your children out of fear of poverty for Allah provides for them and for you. But these are things that men tell themselves to justify their actions, to justify their behavior, right? So that's some context as, as to why the ayat was revealed. So Imam Bukhari mentions the verse to show that there is evil omen in some women or bad luck with some women uh, because they can be a fitna for husbands that distract them from being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the emphasis is on some of your wives, not all of them, all right? There were some who believed that all women were bad luck. Imam Bukhari is saying, no, there are some women that might not be, that may be bad fortune for some men, but not all women, all right? So how can a woman cause her husband to compromise his path to greatness or his path to obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that something that happens in today's time in the Muslim community? Give me some examples. Yes. Um, by overspending his money. Oh, by overspending his money. I, on unnecessary stuff and buying more expensive things that may not be needed. You know, not well, being desiring those things. And it forces the husband to want to go and to go out and for you. Yeah. I know it, somebody who went to jail behind that. That's crazy. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, I'm glad you guys are, are, are you know, understanding enough to, un you know, to, to be able to process this. Uh, someone said uh, by preventing, um, preventing them from praying in the message. Yes. Man is about to go in the message. Why can't you just pray at home? It's just like. 
they won't do it as well. They won't do it as well. Don't be afraid of what you're trying to do sometimes. I know you try to hide it. Maybe like what's your name for it? You need to pray for it. You need to stand by the front of it. You need to pray for it. I feel like people are like, you don't want to pray for it. Yeah, well, you know, try to do it. Maybe it's not going to go. You can be able to pray one time. Mm -hmm. Very good. She said that, you know, a lot of women may not want to rearrange their schedules to be more accommodating for their husbands so that they can pray on time. You know, uh, someone says when a wife speaks on her husband negatively. OK, you you um, just speaking down to him or speaking condescendingly to him, which steals his passion, which steals his, you know, his confidence. Yes, absolutely. Right. Speaking on what goes on in his home, being overly suspicious of him. Yes, absolutely. Being overly suspicious is very important because when you are suspicious of him, especially if he has nothing to hide and he bends over backwards trying to prove to you, you know, uh, trying to prove to you that, you know, he didn't do anything wrong or he's not doing anything wrong. And sometimes in trying to prove to you that he ends up, you know, compromising, you know, his path. So, yeah, there are a lot of examples where this happens. And believe it or not, women, you guys have so much power over your husbands and you don't realize that. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look deeply into the ayat, Allah says, indeed, from amongst your wives and your children are enemies to you, meaning because they make you compromise. That's speaking to power that women and children have over their men. And you have to be able to look deeper into the ayah and see that that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to. You have so much power over your men that you can make them disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can make them disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, very important. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar, he said, perhaps Imam Bukhari is alluding to the hadith that will further explain this concept. This hadith was collected in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, and it was graded as authentic, graded as Sahih by Ibn Hibban. And this hadith, this hadith is where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or it was mentioned on the authority of Saad ibn Saad as Saidi, um, and this is a narration from a companion, and we consider all of the companions to be um, trustworthy, and so. Even if they don't say the Prophet Sallallahu said it, then we can still take it from one of the Sahaba because we know that they heard it directly from the Prophet Sallallahu He says, Min Sa'ada Tibni Adam Tharatha. From the joy and happiness of the child of Adam are three. And he's talking about the men. From the joy and happiness of a man, the joy and happiness of a man are found in three things. Al-Mar'atu Saliha, a righteous woman. Wal maskan a salih and uh, a spacious house. Wal markab a salih and uh, a durable riding animal or a durable vehicle. Man's joy is found in three things a righteous woman, a spacious home, and a reliable vehicle to get around on. He said, Wal shakawa tibni adam taratha. And the um, the lack of joy and the depression of man is found in three things. Al-mar'atu su, an evil woman or a woman with bad character, bad behavior. wal maskan is su, and a, spa and, a, and a home that is not spacious enough, that is dayyik, that is very restricted. And al-markab a su, and an unreliable vehicle. Unreliable vehicle. And so if you think about most men, what they really want in life or where they find their joy and their pleasure, where they would actually be comfortable in life is when they have a woman who is loyal and God-fearing and willingly compliant with him and his demands, his reasonable demands. This is a righteous woman, uh, a spacious home, a, you know, a home where he can live, where he has his own space, his wife has her space, spacious enough for him, and a, a reliable vehicle. A reliable vehicle to get from point A to point B, you know, without worrying about it breaking down on him. And you'll find that if a man has those three basic necessities, then you'll find that, you know, he's at peace in life. Most men are at peace in life if they have these three things. 
And the dissatisfaction and, and the grief and anxiety that men suffer from, the depression that men suffer from, is because of the lack of these three things. He doesn't have a righteous, loyal, God-fearing, willingly compliant woman. He doesn't have a spacious home where he can live, you know, especially, you know, if he has children. Men need to have their own space. You understand the best thing that you can do for your man when you move into an apartment or you move into a spacious home is to create a space specifically for him. Whether that is with him and his games or him and his books or him and whatever it is, he just needs to have space to himself. Separation creates fondness of the hearts. When you guys are separate, even if you're in separate rooms, even if the husband goes downstairs, she goes upstairs in the bedroom and they're separated and they're texting each other, you know, um, I'm downstairs watching the game. I'll be up in a little bit or I'm in the basement, you know, playing the game. I'll be up in a little bit. That little bit of space apart is enough to kind of, you know, refuel, you know, that energy. It's like plugging your phone into an outlet and recharging your battery. When we are together, we drain each other. And when we are separated, then we are repowering our battery, right? We're repowering our battery. There was a, a movie that Will Smith made some time ago that was um, that was based upon this. You guys know, know what I'm talking about? Um, where he was like the superhero. What is it called? I Am Legend. Is it I Am Legend? No, not. What was the other one? Huh? He was like a superhero who was drunk. Hancock. 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 Right, 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 right. That was the concept in Hancock, right? So every time him and the sister came close, you know, their 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 batteries became drained. Uh, you know, they got weak. But the further they got apart from each other, the stronger they became, right? So it's the same concept, the same concept. So if a man doesn't have, you know, a spacious home, he doesn't have a righteous wife and he doesn't have a reliable vehicle, you will find men are stricken with grief and depression and, you know, a lack of happiness and joy in his life um, because he doesn't have these three things. All right. So Imam Bukhari brings four hadith under this chapter, each of these hadith reinforcing the concept of the title. Three of the hadith are centered around the same thing, and the other hadith we'll leave for next week, inshallah ta'ala. The first hadith is where the Prophet sallallahu said, shu'mu fi fil mar'a wa dar wa faras. That evil omen or bad luck is found in a woman, in a home, and in a riding animal. The second hadith kind of clarifies what the Prophet Sallallahu meant. And this is why scholars say that if you want to understand the hadith, you have to gather all of the hadith that speak to that same concept and read all of those hadith and then the hadith will make sense to you. Because sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu said things that seem like a little vague. And he said it in front of people who understood what he meant. And then sometimes he said the same thing, but in a little bit more detail because of the people that he was speaking to. So when you find that there's another version of this hadith or there's a longer version of the hadith, that means that the Prophet wasallam either said it multiple times or there were multiple sahaba giving you what they heard. One sahabi may have heard only one this one sentence, but another sahabi was there and he heard the entire sentence. So that's why you'll have multiple hadith some wordings are longer than others, and that is because one companion is telling you what he heard, another companion is telling you what he heard. But when you gather all of those hadith together, you can see the clear, you can see the picture more clear. Does that make sense? So the first hadith, he says, that evil omen or bad luck is in a woman, in a home, and in a riding animal. It's kind of vague. But then when we go to the second hadith, we find a longer phrase. The same hadith, but just some other words added to it that a sahabi heard that this one didn't hear. In the second hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, In kana shu'mu fi shay. If there was a such thing as bad luck in anything, showing you what? He said, if there was a such thing as bad luck. What does that tell you? 
What does that tell you? That is no such thing as bad luck. Right, that the Prophet ﷺ didn't actually believe in bad luck. But he's saying for the sake of those who do believe or those who came from pre-Islamic, you know, the pre-Islamic belief that there was a such thing as evil omen or bad luck. He's saying if there was a such thing as bad luck, then it would be, it would be. In Kana Ashutmufi Shay, if there was a such thing as bad luck in anything, for Fiddar wal Mara wal Fars. He said then it would be in a woman, in a home, as well as in a riding animal. So he's saying that if there was a such thing as evil omen in anything, that it wouldn't be in these three things. Saying showing you that there is no such thing as bad luck in these things. But if there were to be a such thing as bad luck, then it would be in those three things, because those are three things that most men consider extremely important. And that if those three things are compromised, he is not going to have any happiness in his life. So if a woman is ob obedient, a source, she will be a source of peace for him and has good character. She, she will be a source of peace for him. His house is spacious enough for him, a place of peace and comfort for him. And if he has adorable riding animal, then the man will find peace and ease in his life. But if he does not have these three things, meaning he doesn't have an obedient wife, he doesn't have a spacious home, and he doesn't have a reliable riding animal or vehicle, then his life is not going to be, you know, he's not, his life is not going to be joyful or happy. He's going to experience dissatisfaction, mental fatigue, right? And he's going to also experience in modern vernacular depression. So the evil omen or the bad omen that people attribute to these three things are based upon their fears. But those who trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't believe in evil omen. They don't believe in evil omen. Evil omen is only or bad luck is only for the people who believe in them. And believe it or not, when you believe in these things, you are actually speaking, you know, evil into existence. We believe that words have power. Is that not part of our Islamic belief? Am I saying something that is outside of Islam? Do we believe in Islam that words have power? Do we believe that? Do we believe that you can speak something into existence? Yes. There is a such thing as making dua against yourself. Did you know that? You could make dua against yourself and not even realize it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you to it. Allah tests you to it. He just decides that he's going to test you. And this is why we are we carefully calculate what comes out of our mouths. Because the things that come out of your mouth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test you with it. Right? This is why choosing a good name is important, right? Exactly. Great point. Choosing a good name is important. The Prophet Sallallahu said, when you name your child, choose the best names of children. Why? Because children take on the characteristic of the names that you give them. And that is a fact. We literally see that. We literally can see how you give a child a name and that child actually starts to conform to the meaning of that name. This is why it's important to give your children good names. Why it's important to give your children good names. Why? Because the name that you give your child, you're either setting your child up for failure or you're setting your child up for success. I named my, my fourth son, Suhail. And wallahi, I kid you not, this is literally the sweetest kid, man. The sweetest kid. There were aspects about my character, you know, early on in my in, in my development. There were aspects of my character that 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 was a bit harsh, was a bit rigid and a bit rough. That's what the word shadid means. And mind you, I wasn't knowledgeable of the Arabic language at the time that I took on this name. Right. This was a name that someone gave to, a group of brothers gave to me because they saw, you know, some some harshness or some 
you know, rigid, rigidity in me, you know, that they might have interpreted as good, you know, when you're young, that looks like a good thing. But as you start to mature, that harshness, it, it starts to look differently. You know, harshness, when it's put in its proper place, is a good thing, but not when it's used all the time. And obviously, as a young as a young guy developing and growing, I didn't know that there were times wherein harshness was necessary and times when it wasn't. I didn't have the wisdom to distinguish those times. And even now, I kind of still struggle with it, but I'm a lot better with it today than I was uh, at another time, you know, at other times in my life. And I, I used to hate sometimes how I would lash out at people and how I would respond to certain things that I didn't have any control over at that time. And uh, but I hated the fact that I had that. And so I said to my wife, I said, you know, when we have our next child, I'm going to name him the opposite of Shadid, which is Suhail, which is easygoing. And so, Panallah, I kid you not, this kid, probably out of him and there's one more like him. Out of these two kids, they are the sweetest kids, man, ever. Like, literally would not harm or do any wrong to anybody, man. That's just the sweetest kid. Just literally, he is his name. He is his name. You give a child a name, wallahi, they start to take on qualities and characteristics of that name. SubhanAllah. So, yes, you can speak things into existence, both positive and negative. The Prophet Sallallahu in ending, he said about Prophet Yusuf, and I'm, I'm going to record this because I think people need to understand this. You can speak, you can speak something negative in your life into existence. The Prophet Sallallahu he said about Prophet Yusuf, he said, لو لم يقول يوسف رب السجن أحب إلي مما يدعونني إلي ما دخل السجن. He said, if Prophet Yusuf had never said Oh Allah, prison is more dear to me. I would rather be in prison than what these women are calling me to, to seduce him. He said, I would much rather be in prison than be seduced by these women. The Prophet Wasallam he said, if Yusuf had never made this statement, he would have never went to prison. He spoke that on his own self. If he had never, so essentially Prophet Yusuf made dua against his own self. And Allah answered it as a, as a means of testing it. He said, if he had never said, oh, my Lord, I would much rather be in prison than do what these women are calling me to, he would have never entered into prison. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have satisfied that situation in another way. Allah could have gotten him out of that situation in another way. But because he said, I would much rather be in prison, Allah responded to it. And someone can say, well, why would God respond to that? Because he can do what he wants to do. That's number one. <laughs> Allah is not to be questioned about what he does, but you'll be questioned about what you do. We don't ask God why he does what he does. God does what he wants to do. Second of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, And we will test what you say about yourself. And in another interpretation of that, we will test what others say about you. Which is why when people say things good about, oh, you're the goat, or you're this, you're that, do not take that. Dangerous. When somebody say, oh, you're the goat, or you're the man, or you're that girl, or you, I'm, people say all the time, I'm him, or I'm her, or I'm this person, or I'm that guy, and I'm this person, I'm that person. Very dangerous. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test you with that. You don't want to be the goat. That comes with responsibilities that come with accountability. You don't want to be the greatest of all time. If there was a such thing as a greatest of all time, there, you, there's no one that is the greatest of all time because as Allah says in the Quran, وَفَوْكَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ And above everyone that has knowledge is someone more knowledgeable. Above someone that scores this amount of points, there's going to come another one that's going to score more. There's going to always come somebody who's going to break your record, which means that you are essentially not the GOAT. You're not the greatest of all time. You only borrow that title until someone comes along and does greater than you. And we keep passing that title around over and over again. But if we never give the title to begin with, then we just, we're just we just content with the fact that I'm, I'm good at what I do. I'm not the greatest, but you know I put forth the effort, alhamdulillah, and I'm good with the outcome, whatever that outcome is. Whatever the outcome is.
But we constantly taking on these titles, taking on these monikers, taking on these, you know, responsibilities that are above our pay grade. And we don't realize that until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us with it. And this is why when someone says something good about you in Islam, we should say, Allahumma la tu akhidni bima yakuluna wa khfilni ma la ya'lamun wa ja'alni khayro mimma yadhunun. Oh Allah, do not hold me accountable for what they think about me. And make me, don't hold me accountable for what they say about me. And make me better than what they think of me. Don't hold me accountable for what they say. That's what they say about me. I don't say that about me. They said I'm the GOAT. I don't say that I'm the GOAT. Don't hold me accountable for what they say about me. And make me better than what they think of me. Meaning, whatever you think I am, I ask Allah to make me better than what you think I am. There is no dua that can be more humbling than that. I'm not taking any credit and I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make me better than what you think of me. So very important for us to be mindful of not speaking things into existence. That is a thing. I'm not talking about manifesting. What I'm talking about is that words have power in a good way, in a positive way, as well as in a negative way. Non-Muslims come along and put their own spin on it. I'm manifesting, so I'm going to say this in hopes that that happened. No, you should be optimistic about things, good things happening to you. As we said before, you should be optimistic. Optimism is a part of our religion, but it doesn't mean because I say it, it's going to happen. We have optimism. We have good you know, thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we also believe in the Qadr. We also believe that all power is in his hands, subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in our hands. So we don't take credit for that. Okay? So we'll stop here, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama tasliman kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. So the next hadith in this chapter, which will be the final hadith, and that is the statement of the Prophet Wasallam that I have not left a fitna for men that is greater than women. And maybe that class should be for the men next week. Maybe I'll stream that one live, you know, so that the men, <laughs> so the men can, uh, some men can benefit from that because uh, that hadith is very powerful, um, and it and it shows, you know, a lot of things that we're, we'll talk about next week, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa